Welcome to the new conversation. I'm Dwight McBride, president of the New School. Today's guest is Professor Derek Hamilton. He is a university professor and the Henry Cohen Professor of Economics and Urban Policy here at the New School. He is an internationally recognized scholar whose work uses social science to explore inequality and stratification based on gender, race, class, sexuality, and other elements of identity. By bringing together new ways of understanding economics, he has done incredible work providing policy frames for what he refers to as a moral economy, where everyone can thrive. Very soon, Professor Hamilton will begin his work as the founding director of the Institute for the Study of Race, Stratification, and Political Economy a new institute we are proudly launching at the New School. I look forward to talking with him about that, as well as many other topics. Derek, thank you so much for being here today. I have been looking forward to this conversation. You know I have also, thank you. <laughs> Let's start with a little bit about you. Um, how and when did you know you wanted to be an economist? You know, it was kind of serendipity. I, I went the pathway of majoring in economics because I really thought it was the pathway towards protection against poverty. You know, I, like many other people, I grew up with some challenging economic circumstances, and I didn't want to have to worry about paying a gas bill or a light bill, and I thought economics was the best major for trajectory towards either business or law school. But it was through kind of affirmative action programs that I got exposed to what it would be like to be a university professor where, you know, I did the McNear program, I did the Ford Mellon program, and I got to work with faculty over the summer and do research and realize that that's my passion uh, to be in a university setting. And that also, I like the way economists think. I like the way of trying to understand how, how to maximize something, how to reach some objective given certain constraints. So that was how my mind worked. Uh, I realized you can make a comfortable living in, in a university setting and then have agency in your life. And, and it just, I got lucky, basically. Were there, were there particular mentors um, that, that influenced you in that process along the way? You know, that, that's an excellent question and makes me reflect a little bit because it wasn't just college, it was throughout my life. And, sure. and that probably has driven me to want to be a, a scholar that imparts knowledge upon others um, and just life lessons. Because all throughout life, I've been lucky where I've been exposed to people who've had a love for knowledge and have conveyed it in a way that, I guess, uh, made me eager to seek that knowledge as well. From Brooklyn Friends School, which is a Quaker school in Brooklyn that uh, focuses on an ethical as well as a, um, dare I use the word, rigorous education. Um, but, you know, I, I think uh, a love for learning, but a love for learning with a purpose was instilled into me by many along the way. I hear that. I hear that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your work as an economist. Um, you um, use the term moral economy um, in, uh, in your work. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about what you mean by that term, what work that term does uh, for you. How we define economic well-being is important. And there is a pervasive narrative that has, that has centered self-interested accumulation with no bounds and other metrics like GDP per capita as the sole and paramount indicator of how one should measure economic health. There's nothing natural about that me measurement, that that is based in some value, some grounding. And I'm of a mindset that those are not the, the best metrics or the only metrics to identify economic well-being. In fact, it has not been the sole metrics in my discipline of economics throughout its long trajectory. But yet it has become synonymous with how we define economics as a discipline. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the long trajectory of political economy, and even societal well-being, we should recognize that how we measure health, economic health, has to extend beyond those self-interested, motivated indicators of, of individual accumulation 
as well as even macro indicators of GDP or GDP per capita, that one has to, you know, I love Amartya Sen's conception of human capabilities. One has to account for and measure and use as a, as a guideline things like human dignity, human flourishing, authentic agency. Even the term agency in economics has been in some ways co-opted, co-opted as if the market is the sole facilitator of individual agency and that that is the, the best arbiter of who's deserving and who's not deserving. When in fact, if we're talking about authentic agency, we need to recognize that people need more than just their free will, they need resources. They need resources and structures. So a moral economy is one where there's a baseline set of goods and services that are essential, that without them, you really don't have agency, along with the structures that permit people to really be their best selves and really have authentic agency. It's about trying to bring into the mix or even, uh, if you will, quantify um, human well-being. I mean, how are people doing, right? And not just what the numbers say about how the economy is doing, right? I, 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 I love that. You really do need a humanist perspective if you're going to look at social science well-beings. We, we need to center human beings and narratives and our history. The richness of all our culture, if we really want to, to have the best metrics of well-being. And, and one other slight point that's relevant to this pandemic, and that is there was a period in which we were debating when and how to um, not to open the economy back up. And I hate that word, open the, the economy. I just, I'm lost of words. But we made a moral decision to hibernate the economy to preserve lives, to, to tell people to go home and not be in the workplace where you're at risk of, of contracting the virus. Then people describe this as a juxtaposition of economics and, uh, and uh, well-being or, or health. There is no juxtaposition. If you can't center health as part of our economic well-being, you're missing the point. <laughs> Period. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I, I, I could. I on both of the points you just made, I could not agree more. Um, I, 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 I want to talk a little bit about your very public-facing work too. I mean, you served on the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force. You're often sought out for your advice uh, and counsel by political leaders and by the media. Um, how have you approached that part of your more public-facing work as an economist? I'm driven by change. I mean, I, I guess that there's a motivation that either has been instilled in me by people who I've engaged with, or it's intrinsic. I have no idea. But beyond that, I feel I have a responsibility to the extent that I can to, to make change in society. And that has to go beyond the academy. That has to be engagement with media, with advocacy organizations, and with policymakers if, if we really are going to make that difference. So, that, you know, that's my, my motivation. And, and then one other thing that's a critique on my brethren in the academy in general. We are protected by a system of tenure. We, we have more privilege in some ways than virtually other, every other occupation there is, even policymakers have the accountability of voters where if, you know, they can be thrown out of office if, if for a variety of reasons, politics, or they just don't do a good job. Well, we have been, you know, with tenure comes a lot of responsibility. It's, it's not a low barrier, it's a high barrier, but it affords you the ability to not have that threat, the constant threat of unemployment on you. And if we don't utilize that for public good, I'm arguing that we're not doing our job. It's not enough. And my and people make their own decisions. So who am I to cast judgment? But from my point of view, I think that privilege comes along with a responsibility to have to try to do good in society. Love hearing that resonates with my own thinking about this too. Um, it's not to say that it's what everybody can or should do, but it is to say that um, there is a unique opportunity that academics have, particularly tenured academics have, to participate in public life uh, in ways that elevate the quality and the caliber 
of the discussion. That's what it means um, to have a participatory and an educated citizenry. Um, we have to be a part of what it is to produce a mature democracy, all right? We have to be a part of that project. You have talked uh, about uh, and do great work in an area called stratification economics. Um, and that's a relatively new term. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what that what that means and how, how you use that term in your work? Yeah. And just yesterday, Google promoted on their homepage a scholar by the name of Sir W. Arthur Lewis, who is the first Black Nobel, only Black Nobel laureate in economics. And if you ask me, he's the originator of stratification economics. But that is the ground, the groundwork for stratification economics, in my view. What stratification economics is, it is a recognition that the current orthodoxy in economics is inadequate to explain persistent identity group disparity, identity group, race, gender, sexual orientation, immigrant status, to explain that on a persistent basis beyond the notions of human capital deficit or some other individual deficit. And, and from my, my read of literature and my, my scholarship over the years, I realized that even when certain subaltern identity groups are able to acquire the characteristics that are supposed to be rewarded in the marketplace, large dispar disparities still persist. And as a result of that, there's a void in the economic discipline that stratification economics is intending to fill. And it is also a recognition that, um, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm committed to economics, I love economics, I'm an economist. And when I'm in a room with non-economists, I realize I'm an economist, but <laughs> I also know that there is a whole lot that we can learn from sociology, political science, social psychology, literature, uh, design, that if, if we really want to understand the complexities around identity group disparity, it has to go beyond our traditional methods and theories of understanding that it, it ultimately. So we try to fuse insights from other disciplines and a grounding of economics to better understand persistent group disparity. Absolutely. Abs or, and I was talking about this with a colleague just, <clears throat> just recently, or also it's the, it's, it, it materializes for me as that voice in your head that you learn as a young black person growing up, that somehow you're not as good as, or not as worthy. And I think about how much intellectual and emotional energy I've had to expend in my own lifetime getting to a place where I'm better with that than I started. And that, and that wasn't, that had nothing to do with what I took on as my identity. That was given to me by the society in which, into which I was born. So to your point, um, those identities do create and produce realities. Um, that if you want to get technical about it, that that can be monetized in a way, right? That give you privilege and advantage, or that sometimes uh, keep you from realizing your full potential. I mean, I, I know we have so much in common, both personally and scholarly. Um, and, and, you know, two, two quick points related to what you just described. You know, one is, I'm, I'm reminded by the work of France Fanon and uh, the psychosis associated with always trying to demonstrate to the dominant group that we're worthy and we belong. To That's some right. extent, it's self-imposed, but it's real nonetheless, but it, you know, it becomes constraining. So it's, it, you know, as I've matured in my career in person, I've been better able to deal with it. That has been a demon in my life, always trying to demonstrate belonging. The hell with that. How much effort, energy, and anxiety is wasted by us in some ways self-imposed because some of it is not real. And, and that brings me to the second part I'll add, but the best article I ever read about affirmative action is called, the problem with affirmative action is that it works. And, and, and what, the, what the article, the thesis of the article was saying is that when people get exposed to these so-called elite environments and realize that in these elite environments, there's some mediocrity in there as well, that you know they're not so, esoteric that you can't perform, that in and of itself is groundbreaking. To put a fine point on it, 
uh, I wrote some time ago in, uh, in, in a book of my own um, that we, one of the ways we will know that black people have been liberated is when we see as many mediocre black people in those elite environments as we see mediocre white people. I love that. That puts a point on it, right? Uh, but it makes it's precisely what you're saying. Um, Derek, I, I, one, I, you've gotten a lot of uh, attention for uh, one of your ideas um, and, and a concept uh, about baby bonds. And I, I wonder if you could walk us through the basics of that idea. I, I think it's not unrelated to what we've been talking about. All right, so baby bonds. Baby bonds is, you know, how is wealth created? We, you know, people might believe that it's through savings, ingenuity, and this, those things are part of it. But the reality is that the critical ingredient for wealth creation is it is wealth that begets wealth. That the difference between a homeowner and a renter is often a down payment for a home. The difference between an entrepreneur and a worker is often that capital to take an idea and put it into action. So baby bonds is intended to offer a universal right to capital so that everybody will have access to the privilege of asset security over their lifetime. The accounts are seated at birth and they're based on the wealth position in which you're born. And then when you become a young adult, you can use those accounts and they're restricted, not because we wanna be paternalistic, but they're restrictive because you know, personal narratives. If you would have gave me a lump sum payment at the age of, say, 25 of $40,000, I probably would have some relative that's about to be evicted. I probably would have, you know, some other urgent need even beyond my individual well-being that I would have to tend to. And nothing wrong with that, you're right? That I'm, I'm all for altruism. But the program is intended to promote asset security, and that's why we would restrict it towards some asset endowment. You, of course, are going to be and are the founding director of the Institute for Study of Race, Stratification, and Political Economy at the New School. Tell us how um, that institute fits in to your plans uh, as a scholar, um, as a public intellectual. So the institute's going to be grounded in values. The values are economic inclusion, civic engagement, and social equity beyond class, but recognizing that all forms of identity, race, gender, sexual orientation, immigrant status, we're gonna be interested in, 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 in studying how those identities can be facilitated. And having those identities will be ensured to be included in those values that I described to you. So, so that's the grounding. Um, we will begin with research because we're in a university um, and we're, we don't own the truth, but it's critical to have a foundation to understand relationships grounded in truth seeking. But as we've all already been discussing, it's gonna go beyond knowledge for the sake of knowledge creation, but rather the second phase of our work will be application. People use the word experiment. I'm trying to get away from that because we aren't lab rats, human beings. Rather, we wanna apply that knowledge that we learn so as to affect change. And then finally, after application, public engagement recognizing that beyond these walls of the academy, we need to engage media, foundations, public, public policymakers, uh, municipalities, advocates, et cetera, not only to disseminate what we find and have informed conversation, but withstand critique for them to bring their lived experience and tell us what we got right, what we got wrong. And this should be iterative. Knowledge is iterative. So from that public engagement, we'll go right back to the research stage and keep creating. So yeah. another quick example, if you're interested in understanding disparity from a human deficit standpoint, maybe I'll be an ideologue, ideologue here, but you're not really welcomed at this institute, sorry. <laughs> but, but if you want to understand structure and resources as it relates to inclusion, please come. We, we want to be a hub. You know, I have an aggressive research platform, but if, if we're not facilitating others, not just at the new school, but beyond, then we're not doing our job. So, you know, in a nutshell, that's what we're about. I love that description. And we are so proud to have the Institute at the New School. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful segue to talk a little bit about education. Um, and you so clearly are passionate about that, both um, 
from the classroom to media outlets to broader publics. Uh, as you think about your work um, and the incredibly important uh, concepts that you're introducing into uh, the field and the study of economics, how should we be educating young people about these ideas um, on, a, on a spectrum? I mean, and I, I, I think as broadly as you'd like about that, but how, how do you think we should be educating young people? What does that look like? On the one hand, education in and of itself is a positive outcome that should be treasured and afforded to everyone. The ability to, to think critically. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, there, there are moral reasons for why we should be educated. To promote civic engagement and to promote the values of humanity and justice more broadly. I believe that these are human values that if from a, a bully pulpit or from a structural level, if we talk about them more and emphasize them more, human beings have an affinity towards that, right? And I, I might be a little all over the place, but even in affecting change, those previous activists that have centered morality and human dignity, they have been the greatest threat to the status quo. When, when, when we get that right, and I think education is a critical ingredient to promote shared prosperity, to promote a, a willingness that it is immoral that just because I'm a man, I'm more likely to get a job than a woman, right? Yeah, that right. comes from, even if I have the power to enact on it, education can fight against that. So, um, you know, in a nutshell, education is not enough. And, and I make this point all the time. And, and I'll say something that might be controversial in that I think education has become a political ruse. I think that we have centered social mobility through education to the point that it has allowed us to avoid collective responsibility and public obligation to promote equity. That by saying that if individuals only get a good education, they will be fine. I, I think that that narrative has been used as a ruse to really distract us from laying the foundation of resources. But that said, I'm committed to education and think that education should be focused not just as an input, but as an output itself. Derek, I, I want to talk a little bit more about education for a moment. Um, as, as an academic and as an economist, um, do you have general thoughts today on what, a, what university presidents in general uh, should be thinking about in this present moment, given their location and situation? I mean, do you get the sense that higher education is, is at an important inflection point? Solutions are going to be collective. That as as an individual institute, the new school, their challenges beyond us. That uh, to ultimately put us in a place of longevity and security in our larger industrial policy as a nation. We need to recognize the unique and critical role that education plays, and some of the solutions are going to have to come from the public. And uh, the way university presidents perhaps can uh, help move that along is think about collective action. Think about working together in ways to, hell, lobby lobby our Congress. But the, perhaps our greatest strength is um, not trying to conform to what everyone does, but uh, trying to, but being ourselves and recognizing that ourselves are good enough and that, uh, you know, an, an investment in who we are and letting us or facilitating us to thrive that, that that's the pathway. Derek, thank you so much. Thank you for today. Thank you for all of the incredibly important and foundational work you're doing. Uh, I very much uh, appreciate you having this conversation with me. Look forward to many more, my friend. Thank you, Dwight. And we're going to have our Brooklyn tour. And it, I'm, it is looking, I'm going to take you up on that. I'm going to take you up on that. <laughs>